Good evening, and what a wonderful room. I understand it's an autopsy theater, uh, so we're going to do a little bit of uh, drilling into history at least, and uh, I'm really thankful for you to come out this evening, and I think we will start with a short set of clips about the speech that I'll be speaking about mostly, uh, a speech 50 years ago given by President John F. Kennedy on June 10, 1963. It was the commencement address at American University in Washington, D.C. And uh, join me in just watching a little bit of it. You'll immediately be mesmerized, and then we'll talk about it and its meaning. And I'll give you a hint. I think it's the best speech any American president has given in modern history. And I hope uh, by uh, the end of the talk you'll agree with me. Thanks. That speech uh, changed history. Fifty years ago, the world teetered on the very edge of survival. Fifty-one years ago, we came as close as humanity can come to complete self-destruction in the Cuban Missile Crisis. And Kennedy was speaking at a time when the world seemed uh, faded for war, and when the clash of the United States and the Soviet Union seemed necessarily to be a clash uh, that could only end in, uh, the, in war, in destruction, uh, in the military defeat of one by the other. And what you, are, what you were watching there was a remarkable and fundamentally successful act of leadership, not only in this speech, but in the months before it and in the few months that remained in Kennedy's life after this speech, to convince Americans and to convince the world that there was a possibility of a completely different approach, and most fundamentally, the possibility of peace between two superpowers that seemed inevitably uh, on the verge of uh, war and, uh, and disaster. And Kennedy, uh, in those excerpts, is exhorting Americans to consider the positive possibility, uh, something that it's hard for us to imagine right now, but it was a speech overwhelmingly to overcome the sense of pervasive pessimism. As Kennedy said in the speech, uh, too many of us think that peace is unreal, too many think it is impossible, too many believe that we are gripped by forces we cannot control. We need not accept that view. And then he says that humanity has often solved the seemingly unsolvable and we believe they can do it again. And I fell in love with this speech uh, about 10 years ago when I first discovered uh, it for myself. It, of course, is a, a well-known speech, but not uh, as known uh, as some of Kennedy's other great speeches. And indeed, this was a speech on June 10, and the next day is an equally wondrous speech, the next night on civil rights. So it's back-to-back -back in two days that uh, Kennedy hit the highest level of not only eloquence, but grace of leadership that one can imagine. Pressed by events in both cases, uh, in the second case, the uh, desegregation of University of Mississippi and the violence that was surrounding it, Kennedy appeared on national television to say that uh, we are confronted by an issue that is as old as the scriptures and as clear as the American Constitution. And he made for the first time that an American president ever did, uh, at least since Abraham Lincoln, the basic moral case for civil rights. And it was a turning point for his administration. It was a turning point for the United States. And it came a day after this speech. So these were loaded days. These were very heavy days. And you also saw in this clip uh, 
the President saying, as he did many, many times, that we could not find peace internationally unless we also found peace at home. We could not represent our views internationally unless we lived morally and in dignity at home. And so, hearing this, uh, I, uh, of course, fell in love with it, and several thousand listenings later probably uh, began to uh, reflect on it and was very lucky uh, in, in this city uh, six years ago uh, to uh, give the BBC Wreath Lectures uh, and featured uh, this speech uh, as a centerpiece of my attempt to understand what leadership means uh, at a time when there is such pervasive cynicism and doubt about fundamental issues. And it was actually a very funny thing for me in the wreath lectures, now that I think back about it. Uh, I gave the first uh, of the wreath lectures, not at the Royal Institution, but at the Royal Society, another incredible uh, historic venue uh, that also has the burden of having Isaac Newton staring down at you uh, as you're speaking, which is uh, no uh, easy uh, lift to make. And I gave a speech uh, about uh, the the need and the possibility to find a path to end poverty and to fight climate change together to achieve sustainable development. Uh, and I ended the speech thinking, that was good. Uh, and uh, boy, was I convincing. Uh, and uh, then there was a chorus of naysaying for an hour, which shocked me uh, and still does shock me because it was in the center of perhaps the very center of uh, the birth of rational thinking in the world uh, with Isaac Newton and with modern science that uh, uh, owes its uh, life to Bacon and to Newton uh, in this country. And by the time I got to the third lecture, uh, which was actually at Columbia University, uh, the speech was a kind of hold for me that there's some hope. Uh, that even when one feels uh, the inexorability of conflict or the inevitability of failure, that it's possible to bridge that. And indeed, I think this period, which I'll describe from October 1962 to Kennedy's assassination in November 1963, was a, a kind of miracle of leadership. Uh, he was not a great president the first two years. Uh, he was a wonderful man, a man full of charisma, a man full of eloquence. But he became a great president for one year uh, after two difficult uh, years at the beginning. And uh, he showed us something about what leadership is and how it's possible to convert a dream that is uh, grounded fundamentally in a moral spirit into reality. And that is uh, the uh, period that I want to share with you uh, today. What makes this episode, this attempt to find peace between the United States and the Soviet Union uh, so remarkable is, of course, the antecedents of the preceding years. The Cold War by 1963 had been underway for a generation. Uh, since 1945, things had gone from first difficult to uh, painful to multiple crises, and then by October 1962 to the very edge of devastation. And this was a burden of a whole generation, therefore, that Kennedy uh, bore and uh, tried to face in finding a way back from the brink. It's probably useful to start with the beginning of the Cold War itself, though this is a, a story that we think we know and we understand. It of, is a, it's a complicated uh, and difficult period. Uh, it's uh, one in which mistakes were made on both sides, and the mistakes of one side uh, triggered uh, a ratcheting of mistakes on the other uh, until there came to be a dominant view in 
both the sides of the Iron Curtain that uh, each was facing an implacable foe on the other. Uh, and of course, uh, that kind of fear of an implacable foe creates uh, fear and creates the hardline thinking and attitudes which validate those fears on the other side. It's probably correct that from 1945 until 1953, the worsening of relations of what had been the wartime alliance between the Soviet Union, the US, and the UK was bound to unravel to an important extent. Stalin was a murderer. Uh, he was uh, paranoid, uh, and uh, he had a very uh, hard, uh, crushing way to uh, try to pursue Soviet interests. So no matter how one parses uh, the various actions that were taken on both sides, and Truman uh, made his share of aggressive moves and his share of mistakes, I think it's uh, probably fair to say in the brief time that we have to discuss these issues that until Stalin's death there was really probably little hope for uh, a calming of the Cold War. And since the U.S. had uh, launched the nuclear age uh, in August 1945 and the Soviet Union was able to follow with its own nuclear weapons in 1949, not only was there the clash of these two powers in Europe centered over Germany, but there was also running alongside it the unprecedented uh, and soon to be runaway arms race of nuclear weapons. So this was a period, like many, uh, in many in modern history that was unprecedented for its participants. There were no roadmaps, there was no off-the-shelf plan of action. Uh, and that's like us in other issues today, in climate change or in energy or in some of the other challenges that we face. There's nothing off the shelf that can tell us what to do. Each generation faces its unique challenges and has to find its unique path through them. Well, the late 40s were, of course, an extraordinarily difficult period because of the onset of the Cold War, the onset of nuclear weapons, the Berlin crisis, which highlighted a key and central fact to understand, which is that the nature of Germany post-war remained throughout the period until 1963, the central issue that separated the U.S. and the, and, uh, the USSR, even though this was often very, very badly misunderstood. Russia was afraid of a resurgent Germany. The West was afraid of Soviet troops uh, halfway across Europe. And so while the West feared Soviet aggression and viewed the Soviet conquest and domination of Eastern and Central Europe all the way to the divide between East and West Germany as proof of Soviet intentions of domination over Europe, the Soviet Union viewed its actions, but through Stalin's paranoid lens, as, as a way to protect the Soviet Union from a third resurgence of Germany uh, after the two devastating wars. But the two sides could not agree because of these different perspectives on what the fate of Germany should be. And in 1945, there was a brief period where both sides agreed that Germany should be kept de-industrialized uh, de and repressed for fear of what a resurgent industrial power could mean. The U.S. had a so-called Morgenthau plan named after the Secretary of the Treasury of the time. And the Soviets were more or less along that line. But as the situation quickly began to harden, uh, into the first uh, episodes of the Cold War, especially because of Soviet brutal domination over Poland uh, and other countries in Eastern Europe, the US and UK and France as the three occupying powers started to feel that 
the Western occupation zones really were implicitly and soon would be explicitly the barrier line to prevent further Soviet incursions into Europe. And so very soon a dynamic took place that was incredibly destructive. On the one side, the Soviets feared more than anything a resurgent Germany. And on the other side, the West feared a, a powerful Soviet Union and an aggressive and closed society and obviously a cruelly led society and therefore felt that building up Germany, at least the three out of the four occupation zones, was the central importance uh, in uh, the uh, aftermath of World War II. And indeed, starting in 1947, Germany began to be rebuilt. The Marshall Plan came. That created a yet more extreme divide. And then the three Western occupying powers decided that not only would their zones recover economically, but this would be a new West Germany. There was never a treaty, never a settlement, never a shared view about the future of Germany as a result. And there wouldn't be until 1989, uh, until uh, Gorbachev made possible the end of the Cold War. Uh, but until then, Germany remained the centerpiece of this phenomenally destabilized and amplified by the nuclear arms race, which was a technological uh, uh, race that went alongside, but at some, in some way was distinct from the political issues that underpinned the Cold War itself. By the early 1950s, the Soviet uh, doctrine was that the US and its allies were rebuilding Germany to reinvade the Soviet Union. And there were not a few American generals that loved the idea. Uh, and indeed, uh, the United States uh, had uh, a large uh, nuclear advantage. Uh, this was another point of typical, massive, uh, mutually defeating uh, confusion. The Soviets had the uh, boots on the ground uh, in the Red Army uh, distributed across Eastern and Central Europe. The United States responded by building its nuclear arsenal. And so the idea was that the US could not win a conventional war against the Soviet Union, but would retaliate with what was called massive retaliation through a nuclear force. To the US and the Western side, this was defense. To the Soviet side, this was pure offense, uh, that uh, this was an attempt to gain uh, a superiority so large in nuclear weapons that the Soviet Union would be attacked uh, in a first strike by the West. And as I said, it doesn't help that a number of people relished the thought wrote about it, studied it, lectured about it, and believed that it was exactly the right thing to do. And in such a circumstance, of course, uh, both sides shortened the fuse uh, on uh, the weaponry for fear that the other side would launch a first strike and take out the capacity of the other side to retaliate or to survive. And so the weapon systems became uh, more and more uh, on the very short fuse. And the shorter the fuse, of course, the more that hotheads on both sides would say, we better go now because they're about to strike. And whenever a crisis came, you almost rushed to the self-fulfilling prophecy that you must move first and you must move now. And anybody that delays is threatening the vital security uh, of their side of the conflict. And so what the game theorists and the nuclear strategists sometimes portrayed as a balance of terror, or what was called appropriately by its acronym MAD, Mutual Assured Destruction, was anything but a balance. It was an unstable, extraordinarily dangerous, uh, ever-shifting and ever-changing 
psychological battle line filled with first hundreds, then thousands of nuclear weapons on each side. In 1953, Stalin had the good judgment to die, uh, or someone uh, may have had the good judgment to kill him, we don't know, uh, but uh, a monster of the 20th, 20th century uh, died. And there was a chance for uh, at least a thaw, uh, for an easing of the tensions. And Eisenhower gave a speech almost exactly 10 years before Kennedy's speech uh, that is an important speech to look at, partly because of what it said and partly because of the difference of how Eisenhower approached the problem from how Kennedy would approach the problem 10 years later. Eisenhower was excited. He thought that this was a chance for making a breakthrough. Many of his aides were much less excited. The American doctrine was that the Soviet Union was a communist monolith out for global domination, that it would stop at nothing less, and that any attempt to make a thaw or to make a peace was a fool's errand. And the Secretary of State at the time, John Foster Dulles, uh, who I was reminded in walking through uh, the Churchill Museum yesterday, was uh, termed by Winston Churchill as Dole, Duller, Dullest, uh, and uh, a very apt uh, description of uh, Mr. Dulles, was a hardliner, uh, a rigid thinker, uh, and a constant drag on uh, Eisenhower's better instincts. Eisenhower had good instincts, by the way. Uh, he was a, a great general, he was a decent person, uh, and he believed in peace. Uh, and he believed that there could be a way to peace. But he was not, ironically, a strong leader uh, as president. Uh, and he deferred to colleagues. He deferred to Dulles and often to Dulles' brother, Alan Dulles, at the CIA. Uh, if there were an adjective beyond Dullest, it would be Allen's, uh, to, to hold uh, a, a real creep in American history who headed uh, the creepiest institution of modern American history. Uh, the CIA and did a tremendous amount of damage uh, over the years. But Eisenhower gave a speech called Chances for Peace uh, in 1953. And he said some very poignant things. He actually said for each airplane we build, here are the number of hospitals we could build. For each, uh, uh, each ship that we build, this is the number of schools uh, that could be built. He said we are wasting our time, our money, uh, our uh, human ingenuity uh, in an arms race when we should be solving our problems. Wonderful. Then he proceeded, as normally any leader would, and said, here are the ten things the Soviet Union must do if we are going to find peace. And he provided a list of what the other side had to do uh, if it was going to be deemed as a worthy partner in peace. It accomplished nothing in the end, uh, in part because uh, a power struggle uh, was still underway in Moscow after uh, Stalin's death. It would be two more years before Khrushchev would become the uh, unique leader and the Soviet side was not ready uh, to be an interlocutor. But also the approach was not an approach that could work, uh, that said uh, the other side must make many concessions, here's a list of them, then we'll begin to talk. And throughout the 1950s, the uh, fundamental problem uh, of uh, Soviet uh, domination of Eastern uh, and Central Europe, the unsolved crisis of Germany, the rising number of nuclear weapons, and of course uh, by uh, the uh, 1950s, the thermonuclear weapons, each one of which contained more explosive power than all the bombs that had been dropped in World War II, had meant that uh, as horrific as the uh, atomic bombs were, the thermonuclear bombs were a completely unprecedented, unmanageable, unthinkable uh, scale of uh, destruction. 
Eisenhower hoped throughout the uh, remaining years of his administration, which ended on January 20, 1961, when Kennedy took the oath of office, that he would be able to find a way to peace with the Soviet Union. He never accomplished it, of course. And it's notable how the last of these episodes failed. Because in 1958 and 1959, there was another attempt uh, with Khrushchev now uh, propounding a doctrine of peaceful coexistence and very interested in shifting resources out of the military in the Soviet Union to try to help restart or rescue uh, a civilian economy uh, in great stress. Eisenhower thought that there was a chance. John Foster Dulles died, uh, and that opened up another opportunity because uh, now that break uh, on Eisenhower was somewhat lifted. And towards 1960, it looked like there could be a thaw in the Cold War. Two fundamental things prevented it. One was the unsettled state of Germany. What to do? And a rather misguided, miscast uh, misunderstanding by Eisenhower, a lack of awareness and sensitivity that, according to a great historian, Mark Trachtenberg, I think uh, uh, convincingly uh, describes the underlying political weakness of uh, Eisenhower's uh, last uh, years in power. Eisenhower began to flirt with the idea of what was called nuclear sharing, uh, that uh, because of the heavy burdens of the US having troops in Germany and Eisenhower being a fiscal conservative who wanted to cut the military budget actually and get the boys home, started uh, to uh, explore the idea that maybe Western Europe and especially uh, Germany could have its own nuclear deterrent thereby alleviating the need for the U.S. to be on the front line against the Soviet Union. You can imagine how this was received in Moscow. A war that had claimed 20 million deaths at the hands of Germany and where the Soviets had borne a burden unprecedented in all of human history to defeat the German army, was suddenly confronted with the possibility that all of that would be vitiated by a nuclear Germany. Germany's chancellor at the time, uh, Konrad Adenauer, was hankering for this also, which didn't help, uh, creating a lot of nuisance and a lot of headache, but saying that Germany should have uh, a nuclear deterrent or at least be part of the NATO nuclear deterrent. Far more tactically and short term, there was another decisive event which is important to understand to get the backdrop to 1963. And that was that Eisenhower and Khrushchev aimed for a summit at which some of these issues might be resolved, even the German issues perhaps. And that was to take place in Paris in the middle of 1960. Just before the summit, uh, the uh, second at the CIA, uh, another uh, uh, individual in the Hall of U.S. Infamy, uh, Richard Bissell, came to the Oval Office to whisper uh, sweet tidings in the president's ear uh, and to say that perhaps uh, just before going to the summit meeting, uh, we should have one more spy flight over Russia. Uh, just to get the most up-to-date data. Eisenhower thought this was a pretty bad idea, uh, possibly provocative. It was an illegal intrusion into Soviet airspace. And Mr. Bissell, like the CIA has done repeatedly for more than 50 years, lied uh, directly to the president, uh, said that uh, the Soviet Union had no chance of, uh, of uh, detecting this flight. Uh, didn't know about the U-2s, and in any event, the U-2 was designed to disintegrate if it was uh, hit uh, in an attack. 
Uh, and uh, if by any chance the pilot survived, the pilot uh, carried uh, a, uh, a poisonous uh, hypodermic needle to take his life uh, so that there would be no chance of capture. Of course, uh, the CIA knew that the preceding spy flight had been detected by Soviet radar uh, and MiGs had been scrambled, but had only been able to reach about 50,000 feet, not the 70,000 feet at which the U-2 flew. And that little fact was not told to Eisenhower. So Eisenhower went ahead with the flight, uh, and many of you will recall uh, the inevitable outcome of that, which was the plane was shot down. Uh, it did not disintegrate, it broke into two pieces. Uh, the pilot did not kill himself, but ejected safely and uh, landed, uh, and was promptly captured by the Soviet Union, none of which, of course, was disclosed when the Soviet Union announced to the world that the U.S. has been sending spy flights uh, over the Soviet Union. And, of course, the U.S. completely uh, rejected uh, that propaganda, uh, at which point the Soviet Union announced, uh, the government announced, that we have shot down a plane, at which point the United States said, that is a brazen lie. This is a weather plane stationed uh, in Turkey that went off track, at which point there was a wonderful press conference uh, where uh, the cameras were brought in to inspect the U-2 wreckage and to meet Mr. Gary Powers, uh, who uh, was revealed for the first time to have survived the flight uh, and, uh, and, and uh, the shooting, uh, shooting down, at which point the summit uh, was torpedoed and Eisenhower's uh, remaining hopes for finding uh, some kind of path to peace uh, were, were gone. Kennedy came into office on January 20th, 1961, and of course uh, delivered uh, a most remarkable address, which in many ways uh, accurately captured uh, his intentions as president and one of the most famous lines, uh, of course, was uh, his line really uh, drawing from Churchill, let us never negotiate out of fear, but let us never fear to negotiate. Kennedy announced that he had the intention uh, to enter into negotiations to find a path to peace. He said poignantly and I think powerfully and uh, uniquely at that moment, that uh, mankind uh, holds in our mortal hands the ability to end all forms of human poverty and all forms of human life. And so he raised the stakes. He explained that we are at the knife edge. With our technological wonders, we could solve deep human problems. This is our fundamental lesson till today. But with our technological wizardry, we can also destroy the planet. We could destroy it through nuclear arms in Kennedy's day, or even ours. We could destroy it through climate change and our absolute determination to neglect the realities of science, uh, as uh, told in this room uh, throughout history, uh, as another way to destroy human life. Kennedy said he was intent on negotiating. But he was also uh, intent on negotiating out of strength, and he was also intent uh, on, uh, uh, not intent, he was also deeply inexperienced uh, as a young, youngest uh, ever elected U.S. president. And so as his administration opened, the first thing he did was start an arms buildup. Uh, and this, in Kennedy's mind, of course, was uh, to uh, position the U.S. for the future negotiations. And in the Soviet mind, of course, was to position the U.S. for the coming first strike. Uh, and this is the nature of international diplomacy uh, or international strategic action, one can say, uh, which is that if one doesn't think about how the counterpart understands the signals and the actions, the chances for disaster are very high. But even more than that, of course, Mr. Bissell uh, had a, a double act two grand slams in one year. Uh, and that was uh, his second appearance in the Oval Office. And he briefed President Kennedy about a plan that had been hatched in the last year of the Eisenhower presidency to support Cuban exiles in the invasion 
of Cuba. And here, Kennedy's inexperience showed uh, full, uh, in uh, full uh, uh, terrible uh, outcome. First, Kennedy didn't know what to do. How do you turn down the CIA? How do you turn down your military advisors, especially as a young, unproven president, uh, always fearful of being uh, accused of being soft on communism as being an appeaser? Uh, and. Uh, also uh, terribly afraid of directly uh, contradicting uh, military plans. On the other hand, he understood, just like Eisenhower had understood the year before, that's rather provocative to invade Cuba uh, just to three months into an administration. And so he did a pretty stupid thing. Uh, actually, he did a, two pretty stupid things. Uh, first, he said, we'll do it, but no American fingerprints on it, no air cover. If you're going to do it, you might do it and succeed. Not a great idea in my view, but to do it almost guaranteed to fail is a worse idea. And Kennedy uh, went ahead, gave the green light to the invasion, and of course it was a complete debacle. The ships were sunk as they were coming uh, into the bay. All of the exiles were killed or captured uh, within uh, a short number of hours. Uh, it was a complete, total disaster. Uh, and uh, Khrushchev wrote a startling note to Kennedy because already by April 1961, they had gotten into a very important habit which played a role in saving the world, and that was they were writing private correspondences to each other. Correspondences not circulated by government, and where they had agreed, remarkably, we will never use these for the media or for propaganda's sake. They will remain for us only. Kennedy outlined the few people that would see them, told uh, Khrushchev, these are the only people that will ever see your correspondence. And there began about 100 letters back and forth uh, till Kennedy's death that were absolutely remarkable. But after two months of Bon Ami, uh, and uh, cheer and looking forward to a summit came from uh, Khrushchev an agitated letter. What are you doing? American piracy in the high seas. Your country is attacking illegally the island of Cuba. I know, Mr. President, you must not, ha I'm sure you have nothing to do with this, but you should know what's underway. Kennedy did something really stupid uh, to compound all of this. He wrote back, us? We have nothing to do with this. This is uh, Cuban exiles. This isn't the United States. Khrushchev wrote back <laughs> an explosive note. Mr. President, are you kidding? What are you telling me? These are your planes. These are your ships. These are your weapons. This is the CIA. This is your training. Don't ever write to me such lies. Very powerful. And from Khrushchev's point of view, two bald, direct lies from US presidents in less than a year at a time when ostensibly the two sides were aiming for peaceful coexistence. Soon after was Kennedy's summit with Khrushchev in Vienna. And you can imagine the consequences. Uh, it was a terrible, event from Kennedy's point of view. Khrushchev berated him, pressed him, blustered, uh, and did one absolutely uh, horrifying thing from Kennedy's point of view. And that was to say that since there had been no resolution of Germany over the preceding 16 years, the Soviet Union was going to unilaterally recognize the GDR that would be the end of it, and it would eliminate Western rights to West Berlin. And so Kennedy was told in Vienna that uh, what had been the flashpoint and possibly the war uh, trigger in the Berlin airlift at the end of the 1940s would be his first massive crisis. Kennedy explained to Khrushchev that this was a fundamental a uh, uh, fundamental stake of the West. The West would never peacefully 
cede its access to West Germany, that what Khrushchev was proposing would fundamentally change the status quo in a way that was completely unacceptable to the United States and to the West, and that it could lead to war. And Khrushchev just shrugged and said, so be it. This is what we're going to do. And left Kennedy spluttering uh, and horrified at uh, what he had just experienced. He came out from the summit exhausted, depressed, and wondering how things had spiraled so badly wrong so fast uh, in the first few months of the presidency. In the end, ironically, what stopped the Berlin action uh, it was none other than the Berlin Wall. A part of the reason for uh, Khrushchev's uh, agitation in Vienna was not only the unsolved problem of Berlin, not only the or not only the unsolved problem of Germany, and not only the talk about nuclear sharing, which continued to that point, but also the massive flood of East Germans that were leaving uh, East Germany via the West Berlin, via West Berlin, which was still an open border. And the wall was suddenly put up in August 1961. And Kennedy understood intuitively from the first moment, don't challenge it. It's on the Soviet side. And ironically, it will perhaps prevent war because it will take away part of the agitation that was leading to the unilateral demands on a German settlement. And sure enough, Khrushchev essentially dropped those demands, but the issue of Germany remained fulminant. But Khrushchev was looking for a way back. And of course, the way back proved almost to, to be the ultimate disaster. Uh, he thought about it in the fall of 61 uh, and came up with uh, his scheme, uh, the worst imaginable, and that was to put intermediate range offensive weapons in Cuba. Uh, and do that in the face of explicit uh, and repeated promises that the Soviet Union would never do that. And uh, it's remarkable uh, to watch Khrushchev describe this idea to his Soviet counterparts in the memoirs from the Soviet side. Khrushchev uh, tells Gromyko, the foreign minister, I have this great idea. We're going to even the score. The U.S. has its missiles in Turkey. We're going to have ours in Cuba. Uh, the U.S. is going to try to invade Cuba again. We're going to have our nuclear weapons there. We'll provide a complete protection against an invasion. All we have to do is put in these missiles. And Gromyko basically says, and I'm paraphrasing, are you nuts? Are, are you, do you want war? And Khrushchev, and I think it's just remarkably important for us to understand how these things happen, say, of course I don't want war. War, this has nothing to do with war. This is politics, minister. This isn't about war. This is about, about evening the balance. This is about uh, restoring some strategic balance uh, on the Soviet side. The, war, no way, nothing about war. And he goes to the Politburo and says the same thing. And they allow it to go forward. And of course, Khrushchev in no way wanted war. It was the last thing on his mind. And human beings are able to do such stupid things, incredibly stupid things. It's probably not true, though it seems that way, that the higher you get, the stupider. <laughs> but it is true that the higher you get, the more dangerous your stupidities probably equal stupidities all the way up and down. But Khrushchev's idea was absolutely disastrous. And Kennedy, on his side, was constantly battling the hardliners who said the Soviet Union are gonna, is going to make a military base in Cuba and it's going to put nuclear weapons that are going to threaten the United States. And Kennedy said, never. We will never allow that to happen. And as long as I'm president, this is American policy, and it won't happen because the Soviet Union has promised us time and again it will never happen. And Khrushchev thought he was going to somehow just sneak in those missiles 
and unveil them after the midterm 1962 elections and create a new fait accompli. And of course, it's a little bit dunderheaded to think you're going to have large convoys of ships under wraps carrying huge cargoes and not have somebody ask the questions. And of course, in October, the president was alerted that this time the CIA got it right, but don't take that as any vindication of the CIA, please. Uh, the record is so bad that they could get it right multiple times and not even come close to vindication. But they did uh, find the missiles, uh, and uh, Kennedy, uh, of course, uh, faced the uh, gravest crisis uh, that uh, the world has ever faced suddenly and unexpectedly uh, in uh, October 1962. And as all of you know, Kennedy created an executive committee, XCOM. Uh, we have the tapes of XCOM, absolutely a remarkable uh, historical record to listen in on the deliberations over 13 days. And it's startling, of course, stunning 50 years later, 51 years later, how close the world came to complete destruction. The first day, almost everybody, including Kennedy, thought that war was imminent and that, uh, uh, that uh, the US would soon launch a first strike to take out the missiles. And Kennedy was inclined in that direction the first day. At the end of the day, Robert Kennedy said, we better wait. This is not American to launch a surprise attack. And Kennedy had deep and correct instincts that told him, play for time. And one of his favorite uh, military and strategic theorists, Lydell Hart, uh, whose book uh, he had reviewed uh, the year before, the great British uh, war theorist, emphasized over and over again, take time, don't act rashly, don't act suddenly, build the space for decision making. And Kennedy grabbed himself and came back to that and from then on began to propound the idea of a quarantine that would give time for the Soviet Union to decide what to do as its vessels reached uh, a new naval quarantine line that the United States was uh, establishing. In this period, most of the advisors are saying we have to shoot. We have to go. We should take out uh, the. Uh, we should take out the missiles now. Uh, maybe they're about to be launched. Maybe they're uh, not ready yet, so we need to take them out before they get ready. If they are ready, we need to take them out in a surprise attack. We dare not wait. Uh, one uh, general, uh, the uh, chief uh, of the Air Force, Curtis Lemay, uh, I will add him to my least favorite list. Uh, was uh, hankering for war uh, and uh, muttering throughout this whole period uh, almost insubordinately, maybe one could say insubordinately, about Kennedy's appeasement, about how uh, quarantine was uh, nothing but appeasement, uh, about how Kennedy uh, essentially was unfit to lead. You know the story, and the story was that Khrushchev did not want war, and he was horrified by what he had created and how fast it had spiraled to the very edge of survival. It had nothing to do with what he wanted. And he decided early on that he had to pull back as well. And later on when he was asked, were you scared? He said, are you crazy? I was terrified. How could you be a human being and not be terrified at this prospect? And Khrushchev was very much a human being, very earthy, uh, very funny very decent in some ways, but capable of stupidities. Uh, and uh, this had been one of them, and he was shocked by what had uh, quickly transpired. As you know, there were famous exchange of these private letters during this period. Uh, and first, Khrushchev said, if you guarantee no invasion of Cuba, we will remove the weapons. 
uh, and Kennedy accepted that. Then came a second letter that said, uh, added the, to the stakes by saying, and you remove the Turkish, uh, the US weapons uh, in Turkey. All of the advisors said, no, you mustn't do this, you can't back down, and so forth. Kennedy thought it was a pretty good deal, actually. Uh, and Kennedy secretly sent Robert uh, famously to the Soviet mission to see uh, Anatoly Dobrynin uh, and to tell Dobrynin that Kennedy agreed to remove the Turkish missiles uh, on uh, condition that this not be a quid pro quo and that it be kept secret uh, and that it would follow within a matter of months because it had to be a NATO decision. These were NATO missiles, not US missiles, and it could not be negotiated publicly, but he agreed to remove it. According to Soviet accounts, Robert Kennedy also conveyed something that the US side has never acknowledged, and that was uh, his brother's fear, according to the Soviet recipient of the message, that Kennedy was at risk of facing a military coup uh, or a loss of power uh, fundamentally if uh, there wasn't a quick resolution that he was under such incredible pressure from the generals to act and that he feared that war was imminent. No human beings before Khrushchev and Kennedy had ever experienced that responsibility. And my sense is in thinking about it, reading about it, trying to understand uh, these events, that Kennedy and Khrushchev were transformed men after this. The next year was a miracle year, as much as the preceding years had been bumbling, blustering years. Both sides came to understand no more games, and they also came to understand that many of their worst enemies were their own colleagues. That basically, both sides were filled with massively divergent and often dangerous points of view. And that collegial government, such as Eisenhower ran, Kennedy came to see, was an impossibility. And I think this is a basic point about leadership. The only way forward Kennedy came to understand was if he led. And that meant leading in the face of opposition. It meant leading in the face of strident uh, opponents in the other party, strident opponents in his own party in the US South, strong opponents including his strident Secretary of the Air Force, skeptics uh, in the Chief, Joint Chiefs of Staff, skeptics uh, in the CIA, Kennedy decided that he would have to find a way to pull back from the brink. And he also said in remarkable ways uh, on a few occasions to, uh, to uh, uh, counterparts in discussion that he came to realize that his situation and Khrushchev's situation were essentially the same and that they needed each other, and that they were actually more partners in finding a way to peace rather than adversaries, and that they both had to find a way through a political thicket to get there. So Kennedy began to search for this way. He was helped quite remarkably in the spring of 1963 by the most remarkable pope of modern times, uh, John XXIII, who was dying that spring uh, and, uh, of course, was in the midst of uh, the uh, Vatican Council. But Pope John uh, XXIII, after the Cuban Missile Crisis, said that uh, he felt he needed to do something. Uh, and he knew he was dying, but he said, this is uh, the last act I can do is to try to help find a way uh, to uh, peace. And Kennedy, of course, was a Roman Catholic. And Khrushchev, uh, very interestingly, was extremely interested in the Pope uh, and very interested in what the Pope had to say. Uh, and the Pope issued an encyclical uh, in April 1963 called Pachem in Terrace, Peace on Earth. It's a remarkable document. Uh, it is basically a document that says 
international affairs are not merely a matter, cannot afford to be merely a matter of strategy. They must be a matter of morality. And the essential message of the encyclical is we must infuse moral dimension into our international relations. Almost unimaginable, of course. But Kennedy picked up the message. Uh, Khrushchev picked up the encyclical in Russian translation. I think both were moved by it. And Kennedy decided in the spring of 1963 that he had to move American opinion and had to make a breakthrough with the Soviet side as well. And in this, it's notable that Harold Macmillan played an enormously salutary role. And the uh, UK ambassador in Washington, uh, David Ormsby Gore, who was a boyhood friend of President Kennedy, played an enormously salutary role. They were cheering him on. He was filled with, uh, filled with great political concern. Can I survive this? What will the right say? Uh, is there any chance of passing a treaty through a recalcitrant Senate where I need two-thirds of the vote? And Macmillan and the ambassador were both pressing Kennedy, do the right thing. And Kennedy, because of this remarkable period uh, and all of the forces at play psychologically, uh, the uh, spurring uh, also from the Vatican, I'm sure, and the recognition of how dangerous the world had become, decided to move forward decisively. And the June 10, 1963 speech is the result of that. Kennedy was so concerned about his own team objecting to this or stopping such a speech that he had only a very few White House aides working on it. And of course, he worked on it most closely with his wonderful alter ego, his counselor, his speechwriter, Ted Sorensen, who was a most wonderful man. And one of my gifts in life was to get to know Ted Sorensen as a neighbor and to have a chance to speak with him many times about uh, Kennedy and about this speech, which he regarded as his favorite speech. So Kennedy and Sorensen talked talked at length, and, and Sorensen wrote a remarkable draft, by the way. Uh, and uh, Clara Bolger, my research assistant uh, here, who uh, went through uh, the Kennedy Library archives, pulled up the first draft, and it's nearly a complete perfect version. Not on Word, by the way. I don't know how you do it, uh, how you do it on a typewriter, uh, but he did a nearly perfect version. There were a couple clunker phrases that got removed by the end, but it is a magnificent document from the beginning. And he circulated to a few White House aides, Carl Kazin, uh, McGeorge Bundy, and a few others, and then the last weekend to the Department of Defense, the State Department, got the green light, flew back from a meeting in Hawaii, uh, washed up at the White House, and went to deliver this remarkable address. And the main point of the address, you heard some of the remarkable uh, eloquence of it, but the main point was to convince the American people and, of course, the Soviets, who he knew would be listening with interest, that peace was possible. And what he said was so important and unique, and I've never heard it again from an American president, uh, and I'll just read the uh, few lines that I find so amazing. Kennedy says, Some say that it is useless to speak of peace or world law or world disarmament, and that it will be useless until the leaders of the Soviet Union adopt a more enlightened attitude. I hope they do. I believe we can help them to do it. But I also believe that we must re-examine our own attitudes as individuals and as a nation, for our attitude is as essential as theirs. When does a president ever say, let's re-examine our own attitudes? And the whole speech is basically Kennedy telling the American people, you know the Russians are human beings. They love their children. They want peace. They have virtue. They are brave. They are courageous. They don't want war. 
they suffered an extent of war unprecedented in human history. And Kennedy describes how the losses of the Soviet Union in World War II would be equivalent to the complete obliteration of the entire United States east of Chicago and the Mississippi River. And so the whole speech is to tell the American people, unlike Eisenhower telling the Soviets, it's telling the American people, we can make peace because we have common interests with the other side. They're humans. We inhabit this small planet together, you'll remember, he said. We all breathe the same air. We all cherish our children's futures, and we are all mortal. When Kennedy gave this speech, Khrushchev heard it, immediately called the U.S. envoy, Avril Harriman, Kennedy's envoy in Moscow, said to Harriman, this is the finest speech of an American president since Franklin Roosevelt. I want to make peace with this man. Seven weeks later, the nuclear test ban treaty was initialed in Moscow, July 25th, 1963. So coming up on the 50th anniversary, just uh, in a few days. This is how fast it was able to go. A couple key decisions were made because both sides wanted to reach a success. One was to put aside a thorny issue of underground testing. This was a limitation on atmospheric oceans and space testing, not underground testing, because the Americans demanded many on-site inspections. The Soviets said on-site inspections were to prepare for a first attack, first strike. Both sides were right <laughs> in their odd way. And so there couldn't be an agreement then on on-site inspections, so they agreed on the so-called Three Environments Treaty, where you could monitor testing from afar. Second, Kennedy came to understand something Eisenhower had never understood or never agreed, which was that Germany must not get nuclear weapons. And Kennedy made it perfectly clear to Germany that they would not get nuclear weapons, and he shelved all further discussion of nuclear sharing. And one of the purposes of Kennedy's remarkable Ich bin ein Berliner speeches in Berlin a few days after the June 10 speech was to win the hearts and minds of the German people, in part to be able to tell their leader, Adenauer, no. So Kennedy was playing domestic German politics in a way, and winning. Adenauer fell from power a few months later. Erhard became the next chancellor. And Erhard had no interest in nuclear weapons. And Germany, of course, uh, put aside uh, forever, uh, we hope, uh, any aspirations to nuclear weapons. So with these two issues cleared, the treaty was signed. The final point that I'll mention is that Kennedy, of course, was first and foremost a politician, a politician who would become a great statesman through these actions. But he was a politician and he knew that none of this mattered if he didn't get two-thirds vote in the Senate. And he did not know. And he actually was deeply pessimistic about getting this vote. And that wasn't just posturing, that was fear. And the fear also was resonant because of the exemplar of 20th century idealism in the United States, Woodrow Wilson, who had gone to Europe to negotiate the League of Nations as part of the Treaty of Versailles and had come back only to be defeated in the Senate. So Kennedy also engaged in a domestic campaign that was amazing in its fluency, in its fluidity, in not missing a step. He made compromises, he was flexible, but he did everything to make sure the treaty would pass. And he won the support of the American people strongly, overwhelmingly in the surveys. And in the end, the vote was 81 to 19 in favor of the treaty. He spent the remaining weeks of his life touring the country, beginning his 1964 campaign. And what he found in touring the country was 
huge public support, a breathtaking uh, vote of confidence in the peace initiative, and finally, the world as a whole was jubilant within days of the initialing of the three-country treaty, because this was the US, UK, and Soviet Union that were the three signatories. More than 90 countries had signed on within uh, basically a couple of we a few weeks. And I'll just close with the uh, speech that Kennedy gave at the UN General Assembly. For me, it's very moving. I've spent the last 13 years working at the United Nations. Uh, I uh, find it uh, a vital institution, of course, poorly understood and poorly supported. American presidents do go to the UN, but they don't have the same support for it uh, as Kennedy did. And of course, that was a different era as well. Kennedy was the last to ever mention the United Nations in his inaugural address. Uh, and that is also a uh, telltale sign of uh, the uh, stakes and the declining uh, political support that the United Nations uh, sometimes uh, receives. But he went and uh, gave a, another and his last uh, really miraculous speech uh, on peace to the UN on September 20th, uh, 1963. And I'll just read you uh, the end of that speech. Two years ago, I told this body that the United, Nation, that the United States had proposed and was willing to sign a limited test ban treaty. Today that treaty has been signed. It will not put an end to war. It will not remove basic conflicts. It will not secure freedom for all. But it can be a lever. And Archimedes, in explaining the principles of the lever, was said to have declared to his friends, give me a place where I can stand and I shall move the world. My fellow inhabitants of this planet, let us take our stand here in this assembly of nations and let us see if we, in our time, can move the world to a just and lasting peace. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much. Thank you for uh, sharing the evening. And I know we have some time, about 20 minutes or so, for some questions or discussion or reflections uh, about uh, what all of this might mean for the current day. So I would welcome comments. And I think that there, is, uh, there are roving microphones. So uh, if you would like to make a comment, please raise your hand. Someone will find you. Thank you very much. It's uh, uh, great to learn all that. I don't think I got most of that in American history class, so I'm glad I've, I've been updated. Um, how, now that you've learned all this and you've studied it and now you have a, it seems to be a fantastic understanding of it, how applicable is it in the world we live today where we don't have two superpowers facing each other with you know, mutually assured destruction, but rather one superpower um, and what appears to be a, a, a hornet's nest of problems. Maybe if I were to pick one, I would say the problems in the Middle East and, and global terrorism. And, and is there any way that all those things that we've learned in the past can, can help us deal with these issues today? I think that there are two, two issues here that are profoundly significant. One is the idea strange as it sounds, as infusing morality into the core of governance. I think we have lost it. Uh, it's not believed. Uh, and uh, it is our huge failing. Uh, it was ultimately Kennedy's moral statement in this speech and his moral approach to peace that made it possible. It was not technical agreements. Many technical things were brushed away by both leaders in the end. We want to make peace. And it was fundamentally Kennedy's humanization of the other side that was the determining element. We miss this today completely. 
No American president talks about meeting uh, the head of Iran. Uh, we put conditions on, we make demands. Uh, we don't have a sense of the humanity of our counterparts. They don't meet, they don't discuss things seriously. Uh, it's viewed as a weakness uh, even to talk. And uh, we end up in blunder after blunder, assuming the worst of our counterparts. And so this is part of it. The second part of it is the capacity to make things happen through leadership. This was no easy achievement. In fact, Kennedy didn't quite know how he was ever going to get it through the Senate, much less negotiate uh, with, the, with the counterparts. It took a tremendous act of imagination. When Kennedy takes the European tour soon after this speech, and it's 10 remarkable days in Europe, and he goes uh, to the Irish doll uh, and gives a, another wonderful speech, he quotes famously George Bernard Shaw uh, as he says, speaking as an Irishman about the Irish temperament, that some people see things as they are and ask why I dream things that never were and ask why not. And, of course, that became Robert Kennedy's campaign emblem in 1968 and part of uh, Teddy Kennedy's eulogy of Robert uh, in uh, that moving eulogy after Robert's assassination. But the capacity to dream things that aren't is also part of leadership. And we don't have that right now. Our leaders are not leaders, they're followers. Uh, our uh, political mode is... Uh, the focus group. Uh, it is uh, to find out what is the prevailing view uh, and then stay securely within it. There is no guts uh, and uh, the political advisors, uh, with apologies to any in the room, uh, the political advisors play a horrible role uh, in uh, our countries right now because their job is, quote, protect their leader. Their job is to get your leader reelected. I don't know about you, I couldn't care less who's reelected. What I care about is what they do. And if they don't lead, we don't solve problems. And I don't believe that leadership emerges from the prevailing spirit. Leadership taps into the spirit of the country. But the spirit of Americans that supported Kennedy's initiative didn't exist till he created it. That's leadership. I spoke, I've spoken to American presidents, why not this or that? No, no, we can't do that, that's politically impossible. It's a horrible approach. It's shocking actually to hear it from a president, I hate hearing it. Their job is to make it politically possible their job is to ask what's right to do. Not what's politically possible, but what's right to do. And their job is then to find a way to make it happen or to come and approximate as close as possible to making it happen. And Kennedy said something wonderful in this speech I regarded as the best management advice I know. Uh, he said uh, in talking about peace, by defining our goal more clearly, by making it seem uh, more manageable and less remote. We help all people to see it, to draw hope from it, and to move irresistibly toward it. I love that idea. Define your goal more clearly. Make it seem more manageable and less remote, and then people will draw hope from it, and they will move irresistibly toward it. That's the job of a leader. And that comes through fully here. There are so many problems in this world that are deep. They're different from the Cold War, but the problems between uh, Europe, the US on the one side, and the Islamic world is a deep, deep crisis. And it's a deepening crisis of misunderstanding. And it's a lack of imagination and a lack of ability to see the humanity on the other side and you say the word terror and anyone will do anything, including giving away all your rights to your privacy and all the rest. 
idiotic. And we face an equally large challenge on destruction of the physical Earth itself. Uh, we've reached 400 parts per million CO2, the highest level in three million years. We're recklessly breaking the planet. Where are our leaders? Nowhere to be found. It's too long, it's too difficult for them to deal with. They're worried about next day, next week, next month, but we ought to be worried about human survival. And that's their job, or it should be their job. And we've got to make our political systems work better. But in the American system, only the president can make the system work. And I know President Obama's advisors, I think they do a profound disservice to the United States because they are cautious to the point of imperiling our country and imperiling the world because they will not take the risks for peace and for solving big problems. Mr. Sachs, firstly, thank you very much for this evening. Um, my question is, how did the Hawks in the Kennedy administration who previously had access to him react to, be, to, react to being marginalized and how did they mobilize their opposition? I think all of uh, this period was quite uh, shocking. First, uh, Kennedy did uh, dismiss Alan Dulles, which was an important move, uh, and gained some, uh, some control over the CIA, though, of course, some people speculate that the control was uh, less than perfect and that uh, CIA agents may have had something to do with his assassination, uh, a completely uh, unsettled and perhaps never to be settled. Uh, issue, but uh, he gained some control uh, over, uh, over the CIA. Uh, he had to negotiate with the military, uh, and he negotiated with the Joint Chiefs, and he negotiated flexibly. Uh, not perfectly, by the way, uh, from the point of view that he would like, but he won their support for this a bit grudgingly, but uh, they supported him not only as uh, the uh, uh, military supporting the civilian leadership, but also uh, supporting this as a valid political uh, initiative that would not jeopardize U.S. security. And to win that, he agreed on five safeguards, so-called, with the Joint Chiefs, uh, that uh, the U.S. would be ready to resume testing if the other side uh, broke free of this, uh, that the U.S. would continue underground testing, uh, which it did, uh, and uh, other safeguards that uh, the capacity and science uh, of uh, nuclear uh, weapons uh, would uh, continue and so forth. This did not end the nuclear arms race. Uh, by the way, it did succeed in stopping nuclear testing. Uh, in the three environments, eventually in all environments. And most importantly, I should make clear, Kennedy laid out in both 1961 and 63 how he hoped a test ban treaty would evolve into more general cooperation and ultimately to disarmament. Well, we have not reached disarmament, evidently, but the crucial next step that Kennedy foresaw was the Non-Proliferation Treaty, which was agreed in 1968. I think it is fair to say that without, I, it's not just fair to say, it's correct to say, uh, that without the Test Ban Treaty, there would be uh, no possibility of a Non-Proliferation Treaty. In the early 60s, Kennedy and his advisors, McNamara and others, estimated that there would be 30 to 40 nuclear powers within a couple of decades. Uh, this is clearly the number of countries that had that capacity. And so stopping proliferation was viewed as one of the essential goals of this particular treaty as well. So the, the essence of it is that Kennedy uh, took on the challenge, negotiated, reflected on the fact uh, that uh, Woodrow Wilson had been extraordinarily stubborn, uh, had not allowed the Senate any prerogatives uh, in the 
a Treaty of Versailles vote, even things that would not have required a renegotiation of the treaty. So w Wilson was his own worst enemy in, in 1919 and paid uh, the, the ultimate price both uh, of the treaty and of his life for it. Kennedy was determined to be flexible, smart, agile, and get this passed. Of course, there were many uh, shrill calls from the right that opposed this. They lost the vote. And Kennedy was very much looking forward to running against Barry Goldwater in 1964, completely convinced he was going to trounce him in a landslide. And he would have. Thank you very much.